copyright, no part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. Good evening, my name is Jacinta Thompson and I'm the Executive Director and Events and Exhibitions Producer of the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre. I would like to acknowledge that the University of South Australia meets on the land of the Kaurna people. We wish to express our respect for the Kaurna people, their elders and ancestors, and acknowledge the spiritual and cultural relationship the Kaurna people have with their traditional land. I extend that respect to Aboriginal peoples from other areas of South Australia and Australia. I would like to welcome you all on behalf of the Hawke Centre and the University of South Australia to our online presentation with journalist and health broadcaster, Dr. Norman Swan. I would also like to thank Norman for his time and patience, and I'm thrilled this event has come to fruition, at least online, during these ongoing challenging times. Following his presentation, Norman will be joined by Misha Kachel, editor of The Conversation, as they discuss Norman's latest book, So You Think You Know What's Good For You. Trained in paediatrics, Dr. Norman Swan is a multi-award winning producer, broadcaster, and was one of the first medically qualified journalists in Australia. He currently hosts Radio National's The Health Report and co-hosts Coronacast. He is also a guest reporter on 7.30, Four Corners and The Drum. Dr. Swan has a deep strategic knowledge of the Australian healthcare system and his career has been highlighted by his desire to keep the Australian public informed of health developments as they happen, combining medical expertise with journalism. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Norman Swan. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jacinta, and I too would like to acknowledge country. I'm talking to you from Ganigal land, part of the Eora Nation. I'd also, and I'd pay my respects to past elders, present elders, and most important of all, emerging elders. I'd also like to pay tribute to the Wiradjuri people of Western New South Wales who have been doing it tough during this outbreak in New South Wales, really bad outbreak, and um, community-controlled health organisations in those communities have been really doing a great job in the face of quite a lot of adversity. So um, a shout out to Wirad Wiradjuri people as well, and also to community-controlled organisations in general who've really done a great job throughout this pandemic in terms of um, knowing how to approach communities to get control. But we're, we're entering a fairly perilous phase of the pandemic, particularly for uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. But we might come back to that in the discussion because I'm here to talk about uh, the book, which is um, So You Think You Know What's Good For You. I am devastated that I cannot be in South Australia um, another time. And we put this off and changed it uh, on several occasions in the hope that we could make it happen. But unfortunately, that dreaded virus uh, or that drat, dreaded virus has really uh, beaten us on this occasion. So I wrote this book um, for a lot of different reasons. I suppose the most selfish reason was I needed some occupational therapy during the time of COVID um, because I was just sick to death of doing COVID, COVID, COVID. And this book allowed me, I mean, there's really not very much mention. If you're wanting a book about COVID, this is not the book to buy. Um, the, I really wanted to write a book that wasn't about COVID, that was about things I wanted to write about health and well-being for a long, long time. And the reason for that, but behind that is that I just get sick to death of the standard health and well-being book. Um, and, I've, and I've always been annoyed by it, uh, by the approach. So the approach is generally pious. So it's some, you know, excuse me, dickhead sometimes who writes this book and wags his or her finger at you, usually his finger, and says, what an idiot you've been all your life. If only you, you had eaten goji berries your whole life, you would be absolutely fine and you wouldn't be in the pickle you're in now. Um, and it takes away, most health books take away agency from you. They tell you what to do. And as H.L. Mencken, the American humorist said 100 years ago, and I'm really grossly paraphrasing what he said, but the effect of what he said was that for every complicated problem, there's a clear and simple solution, which is always wrong. And that's the average health book for you. 
And I suppose it creates a market for health books because you find one doesn't work and you go off to another. And the, and the other sort of pie, the other thing that annoyed me, like hell, I'm starting off from a very negative point of view, but actually I wanted, well, I wanted to write a funny book. Um, I didn't, people just take it all too seriously and they go down into the weeds when they don't really need to. So I wanted a book that people would laugh at and to realize that there, you, you, you just need to sweat the big stuff, not the little stuff. And too many of us, I include myself in this, sweat the little stuff. And we've got all these anxieties We've got, and we're anxious about our sleep. Now, sleep is important, but you know we're panicking because I'm only getting six hours sleep a night, and I'm told I'm going to get eight hours, or otherwise I'm going to get Alzheimer's disease. When, in fact, just to dwell on sweet sleep for a moment, the evidence—you know—the evidence that eight hours is what seven or eight hours is what you need to get is really just an average when they look at the population. And if you were to line up a hundred people and ask who's got insomnia and who hasn't there'd be a huge overlap in terms of the number of hours of sleep people are getting a night. So there'd be some people on five hours sleep a night who don't feel they've got insomnia. And some people who are sleeping six and a half, hour a night, half hours a night who think they do have insomnia. Now, there's no question that too little sleep isn't good for you. Too much sleep is certainly not good for you. Um, and it's all about whether you define it for yourself as a problem rather than somebody else defining it for you as a problem. So if it's a problem for you, it is a problem. But if it's not a problem, then it's unlikely to be one. And that's what, so we're really good at medicalizing normality. Uh, the other one I ch chose in the book was thirst. I'm, I know I'm dashing around a little bit, but it, um, this is the theme of bursting bubbles, if you like. And, uh, and speaking of bubbles, talking about thirst. So there's all these people with bottles of water on their desk. Remember desks? Remember when you used to go to work and we had, to, oh, I mean, you want to talk about, talking to South Australians, you're going to work, you're doing everything. You're, you know, talking from New South Wales, but you know, people were saying, "Oh, I've been told by my um, therapist, my naturopath, or my, even my GP, I've got to drink X liters a day." So they're guzzling away at their water bottle. And in fact, we were born with something called thirst. And actually, you should just let thirst guide your drinking. And if you want the evidence for this, now it's true that if you're elderly and frail and maybe your memory is going a bit then you might forget to drink and you become dehydrated and dehydration is an issue particularly in summer but for people who are otherwise healthy thirst is a pretty good mechanism it's what we were born for and if you look at elite athletes and why should we behave any differently from elite athletes you might remember um, you know, when you watched marathons you would see water tables and marathon runners were told oh you've got to drink at every water stop you know, you've got to keep yourself hydrated and what they found was that some marathon runners were drinking so much they were getting water intoxication. You can actually get unwell from too much water because um, the sodium in your blood drops precipitously and it can get very unwell. And what they found doing research was that if you take the Ethiopian high mountain runners who often win marathons, at least in the past they did, they run at their best when they're 2% dehydrated. In other words, they've lost 2% of their body weight in water. So they actually want a bit better. And so the instruction for elite athletes is drink when you're thirsty, drink to thirst, don't drink to a prescription. And health and medicine is full of this, where we, we think we know better than mother nature. And uh, the book is full of that, where other people define a problem, which isn't necessarily a problem for you. And then there's the language that people use. So I get sick to death of the word wellness. And there's this whole wellness industry. I, 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 I've redefined it in the book that actually being well enough is actually enough. Um, there was a Charles Akartis many years ago who wrote a book called The Good Enough Parent. In other words, we all try to be perfect parents. It's actually fine just to be a good enough parent. And that's what we mostly are as parents most of the time. And to feel good enough is actually pretty good. Because if you were to believe the wellness industry, um, there's this, if you're a bloke, you jump out of bed in the morning, fantastic sleep, um, full of beans. You go to the, 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 the base, wash hand basin, and you brush your teeth, admiring your washboard abdomen. And if you're a woman, you burst off out of bed, full of energy, rush to the um, you know, basin to wash your teeth. Your perfect children are by your side and you admire your thin thighs and flat abdomen. I mean, what bullshit is that? 
The reality is most of us, no matter what our age is, we wake up in the morning feeling a bit crap, quite like another hour of sleep, if you, didn't, if you don't mind. And we sort of drag ourselves out and we watch and we look at this. And if you're me, you're looking at your abdomen thinking it's never going to be washboard. It's got the shape of a Pinot Noir bottle. And same for women. Nobody's, you know, who's got perfect thighs and, you know, tiny bottoms and so on. And anyway, how would you know that you're well if some days you don't feel well? If you felt well all the time, you wouldn't know what wellness or well-being is. The only reason we recognize well-being is that we go through these cycles and some days we feel crap and some days we feel great. And the days we feel great, we can rejoice in it because we're feeling great. It's not normal to feel great every day of the week. What's also not normal is to feel crap every day of the week. So this is why I'm coming to defining what's a problem. So for example, if you have trouble getting up in the morning, you've been waking up at three o'clock in the morning and you're feeling tired and fatigued and you're not enjoying life anymore and you're getting no pleasure and you're not looking forward to the day and that's every day of the week and it's interfering with your life, with your relationships and your work, then you've got a problem. Then you need to seek help and do it unashamedly um, and, and seek help for it. But if it's part of the normal cycle of life, and that's what I was trying to get. So, and then we all want to live young longer and, um, and we're all wanting the recipe for that. And we're, we all want something simple. Just give us a pill of resver resveratrol or red wine or this um, uh, anti-diabetes drug that people take for a longer life. You know, that, that's fine. That's all, that's all I need. And we try and find these simple solutions. And the book is actually full of paradoxes. A researcher who influenced me very early on in my time when I started being a medical journalist was his name was John Powles, P-O-W-L-E-S, and he was at Monash University in the School of uh, Social Medicine. Um, by the way, we don't really have schools of social medicine anymore. Um, we have schools of preventive medicine and epidemiology. Medicine is a social science, but John Powles was an epidemiologist and he loved paradoxes. And he gave me quite a few paradoxes um, just in conversation with him. He went to Cambridge, University of Cambridge, and unfortunately, he died uh, about three years ago. So um, one of these paradoxes, I, I actually, just to show you how uh, bizarre this whole well health and well-being thing is and what actually makes you well and healthy, um, and that it's not always simple, is um, the paradox of Kerala in India. So Kerala is a state in India. Some of you would know it. You might have been on one of those boat trips on the river system there or the lake system there. Um, Kerala had this bizarre set of health statistics where the life expectancy for Kerala, which was a very poor state, was the same as many richer nations, not far off the United States. And the reason was, I'm telling you a long story, cutting it short, is that they taught little girls to read and write when other states in India didn't. It's a matriarchal society and with high levels of literacy, particularly female literacy. What they've shown looking back to the 19th century, if you look at villages and parishes in Europe and compare one to another, um, who were just as poor, just as bad housing, the ones who taught little girls to read and write were the ones who lived longer. Female literacy is a potent cause of well-being and living longer once, once you get to a certain level of income um, in, a, in a society. Because when, and the Taliban know this, by the way, that's why they blow up schools and kill teachers who teach little girls. ISIS knows this, because when you teach little girls to read and write, the world changes and families have more control over their destiny. I'll come back to the paradoxes in a minute, because this word control is really important. Um, and you've got to understand it before you tackle this project of better health, better well-being. The mind and the body are a single entity. They're not separate. We, you all know that, but we behave as though they're separate. And we behave as though what goes on in our mind has no relationship to what goes on in our body. So if our GP, if you, if you go to your GP with chronic pain and your GP says, look, your psychological state's having an effect on this, many people get angry with the GP saying, oh, he's telling me it's all in my head. Well, actually, the GP is not telling you that. 
it's telling you that your mood and how this pain is affecting your mood and how your mood is affecting your pain is all one entity. It's not in your head. It's there in your body. It's real pain. But why are you resisting the notion that what happens in your mind affects your body and what happens in your body affects your mind? And so with female literacy, it's about control. And, what, and, and so what's this thing called control? So many of you will have degrees in psychology probably, and you'll criticize me for my description here. What I'm talking about is called the locus of control. The extent to which I feel I'm in charge of my life. Um, the extent to which I'm free to make decisions or I'm, I have pressure on me in terms of narrowing what I can do and constraining me. So if your locus of control is over there because you're poor, single parent with three kids and it's there in this thing called poverty, that's not good. Your locus of control is external. If your locus of control is over there because you've got a lousy boss who's driving you at work badly and managing you badly, that's bad too. What you want is your locus of control internally. When you lose that locus of control, chronic stress arises. And Michael Marmot, Professor Sir Michael Marmot, who's an expatriate Australian working in London, um, looked at what's called the health gradient. Wherever you look in the world, there's a health gradient between rich and poor, well-educated and poorly educated. Um, there's a gap. Um, the gap in the city I grew up in, Glasgow, currently is about 11 years between the sort of suburb I was lucky enough to grow up in and the poorest suburb. The health gap in um, Australia, the maximum health gap, not the average, but the maximum health gap, um, as um, researched by John Glover at Torrance University, is um, 45 years. Between the wealthiest, best off suburb and the APY lands in South Australia. So we have huge gaps here. And um, so why have you got that gap? Now, people go into Aboriginal communities and they say, oh, it's because you're smoking, it's because you're drinking. Well, they actually don't drink that much. It's only at the extreme when you're eating crap food, et cetera, et cetera, all sorts of stereotypes. If you ask an Aboriginal person why there's that health gap, they will use words like injustice, dislocation, deprivation. Um, they will use much more generic terms that if that a casual listen think, well, that's not it because you know it's their cholesterol that's killing them, it's their smoking that's killing them. But no, Aboriginal people are right. It is actually dislocation. Um, it's, it is actually lack of ownership of land. Um, it is about all those things. And what Michael Marmot showed studying the British Civil Service in a study called the Whitehall 2 study is that in the British Civil Service, you can see the health gradient as well between the people who run the Civil Service and the people who sweep the floors in the morning. And it's a gradient. Um, it's a gradient in whatever you want to look at, heart attacks, cancer, stroke, um, life expectancy. And so if you could find the magic element that's causing the gradient, the line will go flat because it'd be, you'd have taken that statistically out of the line. So if you say, well, it's level of education because the guy at the top usually the guy, has been to Oxford or Cambridge and the person sweeping the floors, a migrant from Pakistan. So you put education, and education is very important. It will partially flatten the, the, the line, but only partially. Okay, it's uh, smoking, it's cholesterol, it's access to health service. Put in all those figures, they will progressively flatten, but they don't get it flat. He factored in locus of control, the extent to which you feel pressed in your life and you don't have latitude and freedom to make decisions. And when you factored in locus of control, it went almost flat. So control is extremely important. And Len Symes at the University of California, Berkeley, took it further and said, what happens when you lose that locus of control? You lose self-efficacy, the ability to make decisions. And he studied um, single parents in the Bay Area of California in Oakland and found that they lost control to such an extent that if they had to phone up social services for some help, and it was press one for this and press two for that, they hung up because they didn't have the even didn't even have the agency in their lives to do that. They've shown the same thing for women with breast cancer. That quite quickly after a diagnosis of breast cancer, you can get lost in the medical system no matter what your level of education and lose that locus of control. And Professor Bruce McEwen at Rockefeller University has shown that that loss of locus of control has very physical effects. That chronic stress, that chronic erosive stress 
has physical effects in your brain, affects hormones and chemical trans and neurotransmitters, how your cardiovascular system is controlled, your immune system, and raises the risk of heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. Chronic stress. You think, oh, how bizarre is that? It's not bizarre at all when you realize the mind and the body are one. So there is a physical correlate for what they've shown. So Aboriginal people intuitively are actually right about this. So it's about, you know, so, so I, 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 I stay at a high level in the book before I move on to the weeds, literally the weeds actually, um, so they understand this big picture stuff that makes a difference. And what Michael Marmot has shown is that governments play a huge role. And there are nine or 10 things that governments need to do to reduce that level of chronic stress and lack of locus of control in the community to actually live better and reduce this gradient and very unfair gradient in health. And I talk about that as well. So then what in particular, so everybody's obsessed with diet. The second longest lived people in the world are actually first generation Greek Australian migrants to, Greeks, migrants to Australia, mostly studied in Melbourne. And you say, oh, well, this is the Mediterranean diet. I call this chapter, forget the French, the paradox is Greek. Because you know the French paradox, which is actually not really a paradox, but we can talk about that later, which is, you know, you smoke gitan, you eat butter, butter croissant, and you live forever. Um, and they say it's the red wine. They say, well, the second, the French, the French are not longest lived people in the world. Japanese are, and Greek Australians living in Melbourne are not far behind. And they're not necessarily that healthy. So what is it about them? So we say, well, it's the Mediterranean diet. Well, that's true to some extent, but it's not the whole picture. So here's the package that goes together in Greek Australians, which is actually applicable to us all. So first of all, they most have either got an allotment or they've got a backyard and they grow vegetables and they grow their own herbs. And if they don't do that, let me tell you, they are very particular about what they buy in the shops, that it's fresh. They cook. Cuisine is really important. So I'm not saying that a raw diet is necessarily bad for you. It's better than eating processed foods. But it turns out that cuisine and how you cook makes a huge difference to your health and well-being. So if you take, for example, sofrito, which is the basis of many Mediterranean dishes, where you take extra virgin olive oil, which is full of, you, you, most foods are full of chemicals we've yet to discover, and they all interact with each other. And when you cook with them, they interact with the foods that you put in them, put in them, uh, you put in with them. So there's a magical combination here of extra virgin olive oil, onions, garlic, carrots, tomato. And when you cook all those together, that produces anti-aging compounds that you cannot buy in the pharmacy. Cuisine is incredibly important. Um, and the, they cook slowly because if you cook fast, you get caramelization and you get compounds on the surface of the browning of food that, that is pro-aging, that speeds up aging, that speeds up the oxidation and the biological rusting in your body. So they cook slowly. And in Coburg and Melbourne, so there are Greek families with their slow cooking wood fired oven in their garage. They eat with people. So they have their meals with family and friends. Social contact, social support make a huge difference to your health and well being and indeed your longevity. They may have a little bit of wine, which may make a bit of difference. They don't have too much fruit, but they have a lot of vegetables. And here's the other thing. They still belong to the Greek Orthodox Church. And in fact, they become a bit more religious as they get older. And Greek Orthodox Church is about 100 fast days a year. Now, these aren't Michael Mosley fasts. These are best described as vegan fasts, where they don't eat meat, chicken, dairy, etc. They just eat plants for a day. So here they are. They're, this is the whole picture that goes together to help them live longer and more and healthier. They get diabetes, they get heart disease, but they, so, they don't seem to die of it at the same rate as everybody else. Um, and the, um, and, and it's, so you've got this situation where we look for simple solutions and they're not necessarily there. Um, you, and we get into fads. Uh, Karen O'Day at um, Deakin University, who was in South Australia for a long time, 
um, did a study looking with her colleagues, looking at tomatoes and capsicum, red capsicum. So red's a good color. And showed that when you analyze the raw tomatoes, raw capsicum versus sprinkling some mixed virgin olive oil and chopping it up, putting it under the griller, that releases far more antioxidants out of those vegetables than, uh, than if they're in their raw state. Chopped tomatoes are better than whole tomatoes. The stuff that we do when we naturally process food in a home situation, which creates healthful foods. And so all these things, all these things count. And for those of you who might be fans of Pete Evans, just let me remind you that uh, in the Stone Age, life expectancy was 28. So be careful what you wish for. Um, another paradox I deal with um, is the dairy paradox. So, so nothing's, nothing's easy in this world. You know, we want simple solutions and there aren't very many, but, but we can relax about a lot of stuff. So there's been an anti-saturated fat movement for a few years now. And like a lot of these fattish things, there's a, there's a core of truth to it, but only a small core. So saturated fat is the fat that's you know, in red meat. It's, in, in, it's, you, 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 it's partly in the visible fat, but it's there in the, in, the, in the meat itself. And as opposed to polyunsaturated fats, which come from vegetables uh, or monounsaturated fats, which is like peanut oil or uh, olive oil. So they suspected that saturated fat as having a relationship to heart disease, heart attacks and strokes, from a study called the Framingham study, which followed about 5,000, originally 5,000 people about 50 years ago uh, in the town of Ma Framingham, Massachusetts, and followed them through and measured all sorts of things with their life. And they discovered that those who got heart disease, not only uh, you know, subtracting smoking, were people who took a high saturated fat diet, reading a lot of red meat and so on. And so it was pretty clear that saturated fat um, was causally associated with heart disease, although they, nobody did a randomized trial force feeding you saturated fats to see that. So the assumption was that saturated fat was bad for you. And that's guided a, a lot of advice over the years, which we maybe get into in the discussion because there's a whole, the whole stuff about fats, which I cover in the book. Anyway, because there was no randomized trial, because not, nor could there be, um, when they got people to stop smoking and change their diet, heart disease rates did go down. And heart disease rates have been falling at about 2% per annum for about 30 or 40 years. But people who studied, who looked at this further said, oh, we don't believe the saturated fat story. Because when they've done kind of the flip trial, which is actually removing saturated that fat from people's diets, versus a group of people who did not have saturated fat removed from their diets, they did not show a reduction in coronary heart disease when in fact they should have shown a reduction in coronary heart disease. So the world went nuts saying, oh, this is all bullshit about saturated fats. We, we, um, we, 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 we can go back to eating saturated fat freely. And what they found was when you looked at the trials more closely, it depended what those, how those people behaved in those trials. Because if you stop eating something, you're going to start eating something else, even if it's unconscious. So people said, oh, well, I'm not likely to eat saturated fat. I'm just going to have lots of rice, um, pasta, you know, bread, and so on. And if they did that, and they swapped saturated fat and fat in general for, uh, unrefined, for refined carbohydrates, they got no benefit from reducing the saturated fat. Because ref refined carbohydrates act a bit like fats in your body. Whereas if they swap the saturated fat for monounsaturated fat, or even better, polyunsaturated fat, they did get a benefit um, and, the, uh, and did get a reduction in coronary heart disease. So, but what they also showed was that the effect was a bit less than people had thought. It wasn't quite as potent, but it was there. But there is a paradox here, is that full fat dairy food is full of saturated fat. But nobody has shown that full fat dairy is related to heart disease. And this comes back to this story of whole foods. So if you spun off the saturated fat in dairy, 
and swallowed that, that would cause heart disease. But for some reason, when it's in dairy, there's probably antioxidants and other compounds in dairy. When you take it in dairy, it's got a neutral effect. It's not good for you, but it's not bad for you either. Whereas if you took it in red meat, it would be bad for you. So there's something about full fat dairy. Um, and I have to declare an interest here is that I hate skim milk. I hate low fat dairy. And I'm relieved to be able to actually um, have full fat milk in my uh, coffee every morning. Um, and I call that the dairy paradox. So it's not a free slather to eat saturated fat in your diet. It's again, these nuances that previous health books and others haven't really covered. Um, I, I also talk about things that just you know, are not good, which are salt. You know, there's just not very much that's good about salt and when we, should, we should reduce that. There's nothing good about sugar, even though we love it and we should be reducing that. But it doesn't mean to say we can't enjoy it and have some chocolate and other things from time to time or a nice dessert. It's just that we should not go uh, nuts, nut, uh, nut, nuts about this. Um, I deal a bit with caffeine and, and really nobody's found anything bad with caffeine. They've tried very hard, but uh, um, they haven't. And for those of you who've been following me for a while, you would know what I think about supplements, which is nothing. I don't think much about supplements at all. So if you take fish oil, um, there's a study in New South Wales called the 45 and up study. And the 45 and up study is looking at people who age, quite a large number of people in New South Wales who, age, who, who at the beginning of the study were 45 and over. And 45% of those people were taking fish oil capsules, thinking it was helping them. And every time there's a better randomized trial on fish oil, there's virtually no benefit at all in fish oil in the sort of doses you would take that. Now, South Australian research has suggested you take very, very high doses and you've got inflammatory arthritis that can help you. But for most things in terms of preventing coronary heart disease, preventing sudden cardiac death, uh, changing your uh, psychological state, there is really almost no evidence of benefit from fish oil capsules or cosamine. From, um, you know, vitamin D, um, we were wasting hundreds of millions of dollars each year in vitamin D testing. We stopped that. There are some people, uh, elderly, frail elderly people who are not getting out who do are vitamin D deficient. You don't need a test. Just take the vitamin D supplements in, uh, in normal doses. Um, and again, got to watch what you're doing here because people who take supplements take them in pharmaceutical quantities, not in normal vitamin quality quantities, which are microscopic. So if you take vitamin C in food normally, yeah, it's great for you. It is an antioxidant. But there is evidence if you take high dose vitamin C, it starts to become a pro-oxidant. In other words, it speeds up aging. So you've really got to be careful. We, we, we play with fire with a lot of this stuff. And we play with fire and experiment without the experiments um, having been done. The other, talk, the other thing I talk about in the book is how is not to get focused on a single risk factor. So, you know, I've alluded to this before, you know, cholesterol, smoking, overweight, blah, blah, blah. So I've got, so my cholesterol's high. It needs to be treated, got in panic, panic stations. Now, if your cholesterol is very high, you do need to have it treated because when it's very high as an isolated risk factor, that is a problem and that can predict premature death, quite a, you know, quite a seriously premature death. However, most of us don't have ragingly high cholesterols. They're a little bit high. And the point I make in the book is that risk factors very rarely play by themselves. They play together. So when your cholesterol is up a little bit, you've probably got a slightly fat tummy. Your blood pressure is probably up a little bit, not a lot. Um, um, maybe your blood sugar control is a little bit out of whack, but not so much out of whack that you've got diabetes. And these things work together. Instead of adding together, they multiply on each other and actually amplify your risk, which is why what we should start to understand for each of us is what's called our absolute risk. What are my chances of getting a heart attack in the next five or 10 years or a stroke or diabetes or osteoporosis rather than getting panicky about cholesterol level, I've got to go on statins when in fact there could be a few things going on where a more comprehensive intervention like exercise, diet and so on reduces all of them together rather than taking multiple tablets. So, I mean, I, I could go on and on and on because there's lots of things in the book and there's lots of things in the book that are 
biographical. I, I, uh, it's a, it's a, a bit of a, a memoir as well, where I try and illustrate some of the things I'm talking about um, from personal stories. So it's not a it's not comprehensive. It's really what I'm interested in, and also where I can tell stories that have affected me, um, because I grew up I grew up in Glasgow which is a city where, which has the highest coronary heart disease rate in the world, second to parts of India, has very high health disparities, as I've already indicated. Very funny city, as you would know from Billy Connolly, uh, which I can only aspire to. And, um, and a very interesting place to grow up and to again illustrate the point, which is kind of the flip side of the Greek Australian paradox, is there's something called the Glasgow effect which I actually talk about in my next book, but I, um, I'll talk about it now, but it illustrates the point. The decline of Glasgow's um, life expectancy and, and the rise in coronary heart disease dates from probably the late 1950s, early 1960s. Because the Glasgow effect is, why is Glasgow a city with deprivation levels quite similar to other parts of Britain? Why does it have such much more, worse measures than others? And when you look at it, they don't smoke that much more. They smoke a lot, but they don't smoke that much more than other deprived areas of Britain. They don't necessarily drink that much more. The fried Mars bar is, is probably more mythical in Glasgow than, than you think. But what happened in Glasgow, almost uniquely, not quite uniquely, but almost uniquely, was they had the slums of Gorbals in the east end of Glasgow, and not the east end of Glasgow, the south side of Glasgow. And, um, and these were the worst slums in Western Europe. And they went in with the best will in the world, to best intentions, they knocked down those slums and moved people to housing schemes, corporation housing schemes, council housing schemes on the outskirts, well, towards the edge of the CBD in the eastern, around Glasgow, high rise buildings with nothing around, you know, very few shops, not much transport, better accommodation to some extent. And what happened then was people were dis dislocated Remember what I talk, talked about with Aboriginal communities? People were dis dislocated from their communities. Bad as those slums were and those tenements were in, in Gorbals, people knew each other. They supported each other. They had this infrastructure, social infrastructure around them, which it turned out was worth years of life, even though they were sharing a toilet on the same landing. And so this forcible dislocation had a huge effect on Glaswegians which is there till, till this day. So my message here is, don't sweat the little stuff, sweat the big stuff, cherish the world around you, cherish things like cooking, cherish your family if you can, um, and your friends, eat together, get exercise, um, and live this comprehensive lifestyle. I'm not suggesting we all convert to Greek Orthodoxy, but this comprehensive lifestyle, I don't like the word holistic, because that's the way forward, rather than sweating the little stuff. So thanks, Norman. Um, that was terrific. Uh, one of the uh, questions that formed in my mind as you were talking was you you talked a lot about this idea of um, not really pursuing wellness, but pursuing being well enough. Um, but I'm very interested in how you actually know what well enough is and how you can make those judgments, because there's so much information out there that's coming at people. It's very, very hard to know what is and isn't a serious problem. Yeah. So what I, I mean, let me just back up a little bit, because one of the things I'm trying to do in the book is get away from medicalization of the normal. <clears throat> and we're very good at that. Um, and we're very good at that in traditional medicine, as well as alternative medicine. We just love medicalizing the normal and creating a business for ourselves. And, um, and so it's this notion that you've got to reach peak wellness, peak fitness, peak mood. And if you're not reaching peak mood, mood, there's something wrong with you. And so good enough is, look, I have some good days, I have some bad days, I feel okay. Um, yeah, some days I feel fantastic, but most days I feel okay. You kind of know it for yourself. People are really good at knowing how they're going for themselves. You don't need a doctor or a psychologist to tell you how you're going. People know that. There's a lot of research to back that up. Um, that people have a good sense of what they're feeling like. So you, you'll find people who just love, you know, and it's fine, go to the naturopath, do, do whatever you want in terms of your uh, general health care. 
but most people know when there's something really going on and they'll revert to orthodox medicine. And this is not an anti-naturopath thing. It's just to illustrate that we're pretty good at knowing how we are. So what's lying behind your question is, well, what if you think you're good enough and you're not, and there's something serious going on? And the general rule is that if there's something serious going on, it's usually pretty relenting or it always occurs in the same situation. So if you've got a blocked coronary artery um, and you know, you're heading for something bad, you've got chest pain that's not really going away. You've got fatigue that's not really going away. And you've got feelings that are a pain in your jaw that's not going away. You just, and you haven't really had that before. If you had it before, it's gone, it's disappeared and it's come and it's gone. If you've got, um, to, depression and anxiety that, re, that needs to be addressed, it's usually happening on most days of the week. It's not um, that one day you feel up and you're like, crap, and I'm just not enjoying today and why am I bothering? It's that, and then the next four or five days you're absolutely fine. And then you might have another day where you're feeling a little bit down below, a little bit low, not down below. This is not a gynecology discussion. Um, but the, it, it's that it's, uh, pretty relenting or on more days than not during the week. It's hard to get up. You're sleeping badly. Um, you're not enjoying what you're used to. You, you don't want to mix with others. It's hard to get going. It's that relentlessness um, or com how, how frequent it is that tends to give you a signal that this is not the normal up and down of normal life. Um, and if it's something serious like cancer, you know, um, cancer symptoms, Tend, tend not to go away. Yeah, if you have a bit of bleeding from your back passage or a bit of bleeding from your, in your urine, that can be just one off and you need to go and get looked at because one off can be a bad sign. But if it's uh, abdominal bloating, tummy pain, weight loss or a chronic headache and that sort of thing, it, indeed, if that's a sign at all, then it's there every day or most days of the week and, you, and, you, and it's different. So it, it's the, it, it's not, medicalizing the normal you you have a lot of criticism um in your book for the wellness industry and the way it increases this sense of anxiety um but i'm wondering to what extent does the actual medical profession take some responsibility how much of a problem is our is over diagnosis in this sense of perhaps worrying too much or um problematizing things that perhaps aren't problems it's massive um, and the medical profession needs to take a huge responsibility for this. Um, and we overdiagnose almost certainly high blood pressure, um, the risk of diabetes. We have had guidelines from international committees where the committees have been conflicted by, the by income from the pharmaceutical industry. It's in the interest of pharmaceutical industries to diagnose problems that can be treated with drugs as early as possible. And so overdiagnosis, defining normal as abnormal, uh, doing tests which are unnecessary and finding things that you were never meant to find and then diagnosing a problem. If you, just to give you an example, if you were to go out into the street and recruit the first 100 55-year-olds that you find and offer them an MRI scan of their left knee and you don't want to know what their knee symptoms are, it's just anybody off the street, most of them will have abnormalities in their MRI scan of their knee. And in fact, most of them will have a torn cartilage. And it's independent of their knee symptoms. So a lot of these people will be surprised to find they've got a knee, knee, uh, torn knee cartilage because they're perfectly fine walking along quite normally. Because a torn knee cartilage is actually a normal part of aging. Um, and, so you, um, and so you've got to, so if you've got, um, really bad knee pain, it's disabling you, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's not a cause for an MRI scan. That's a cause for a plain X-ray of your knee when you're standing up to see what, how bad your osteoarthritis might be and then getting into physiotherapy, not getting into an orthopedic surgeon because with all due respect to orthopedic surgeons, really all they know about is operating on knees. And even if they're not financially conflicted, that's what they know how to do. And you've got to rehabilitate your knee um, rather than panicking which is what people do, they see a torn cartilage, it's got to come out. And then as soon as you remove it, you're on a track to having a knee replacement because that speeds up the process to knee, re knee replacement. And that's just one example 
of how doctors overdiagnose. And then, you know, they're probably too quick to jump to the script pad when people are depressed and anxious, when in fact milder depression and anxiety is probably better treated with um, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy or an evidence-based psychotherapy from a psychologist. And, um, and you reserve the uh, medication for people who are actually on a more severe scale. And even then, they may need extra help from other disciplines to prevent them going to an even more serious situation. So not just psychologists, you might need social worker help or rehabilitation help or something like that. So you're right, overdiagnosis, misdiagnosis, the overuse of tests, the overuse of pharmaceuticals are a huge problem here. And again, it's in search for perfection. So if you've got a, a medical profession, which is perhaps sometimes making you a little bit more worried than you should be, and you've also got the wellness industry, um, which is obviously um, has a very strong interest in making you um, anxious about things that can sell your products. Um, what, what can we do? Um, like, what is it a matter of regulation for the medical profession? Is the wellness industry appropriately at, regulated? Is there anything on a sort of a society wide level that we can do here? Well, set one, buy so you think you know what's good for you, because that will give you a bit of a manual, but that's tongue in cheek. Um, so what, what you can do is um, I'm a great believer in the consumer driving improvements in healthcare and wellness care and well-being care um, and knowing. So and, and just the trouble is um, Google doesn't necessarily get you into a happy place. But it's trusting your own instincts on, in, your, in your body and asking the right questions. Because, um, and the right question, so the right question is, well, what do you think's wrong with me? So the first thing a doctor's got to do is make a diagnosis and have a differential diagnosis. So that there could be three things that the doctor thinks is wrong with you. When, when your instinct tells you there's something wrong, which is the most likely? Um, what are the right tests to do to find out what's wrong with me that are going to make a difference to my care? Because there's no point in doing a test which doesn't help the doctor make a decision about improving your care. And so if it doesn't do that, you don't do the test because you're not going to find stuff that's going to help. And you might, like with MRIs, find stuff you were never meant to know and create a whole path. You get on a journey but, oh, you've got this bad knee, or you've got this thing in your back, or I found that thing in your abdomen, or I found that thing in your neck, and you go on a track, and you're on a pathway, which you find it very hard to get off, because somebody's got to diagnose that lump, somebody's got to find out what's going on there, and before you know it, you've had an operation, they found out it's a benign lump, and, you know, you're thousands of dollars out of pocket, or you've had a side effect or a complication from the operation. So asking what the right tests are, and then what are the treatment options? And what are the risks and benefits of each treatment option? Now, if a doctor can't answer those questions, then you go and find another doctor or the doctor might be honest and say, look, the evidence doesn't exist, but I think that here. And then what happens if you do nothing? And nobody ever asked that question. What happens if you, well, nobody, not nobody, obviously. But what happens if I do nothing here? What will happen? So if you've got, regular chest pain on, climb, on climbing the stairs and you do nothing and you haven't actually made an attempt to find out what's going on, then um, you might be heading for a heart attack without knowing it. Um, and you, you, know, you might need stress. Now, with it, when you find something that's maybe blocked, it doesn't necessarily mean you need a stent. Um, it could just mean you need cholesterol reduction, blood pressure reduction, losing weight and getting on a healthy diet. Mm -hmm. and in fact, for most people, that's the right treatment rather than a stent. So, it's that conversation that you have asking the right questions and trusting your instincts. It, it, it does seem that at a, at a broader level, before you get to that conversation with your doctor, though, um, we're in a situation almost of an information war where there's a lot of um, people out there with vested interests that will tell you things that will make you anxious or that will um, identify or create problems and offer solutions to them. Um, I guess one of, my, one of the questions I was, I was thinking about reading your book was, um, where do we go for reliable information? I mean, obviously there's your book, there's the work that say you do on the ABC, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff out there that's coming at you all the time. Um, you're not always in the situation where you can go to the doctor and get that one-on-one -on -one consultation, 
where do you find good information? And do you think that there is something that needs to be done about the regulation of some of the misinformation that is out there? Well, let's look at sources of reliable information. So for example, if you come away from the consultation and the doctor says, you've got red toe syndrome, um, then where I go, first of all, and you know, the treatment thereof, um, is, you know, I've got a big red toe and it's gonna fall off. I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm being facetious here and I'm not talking about covered toes, but you know, I go to something called the Cochrane Library. So the Cochrane Library, is so one of the problems that there are that there is in medical science is that um and by the way i although i use the word alternative medicine if something works it's not alternative medicine so if massage works um it, then it's not alternative medicine it's just healthcare and it's medicine and it works if um if taking fish oil works by the way it often doesn't but if it does that's not alternative medicine that's actually healthcare. So the Cochrane Library has done, and what happens is you, if you do lousy trials with too few people in them that are badly designed, you'll either get a negative result unfairly for something that works, or you'll get a positive result because it's been too optimistic and it's been badly designed. What the Cochrane Library, and so you get zigs and zags. So one day you believe it works, and the next day you find it doesn't, and you lose faith in the medical science. So what the Cochrane Library does is that people bring all the data together from all the trials that they can find. They do what's called a systematic review or a meta-analysis. And sometimes they even go back to the raw data, combine it and say, look, in some total, um, you know, taking low dose aspirin when you've never had a heart attack or a stent or a stroke doesn't help you, don't bother. Or if you have, it actually reduces your chances of dying by 20%. And it gives you good summaries of treatments. Now, they haven't comprehensively done that uh, for everything. Um, some people go to the National Library of Medicine called PubMed and do a search on their topic and trawl through recent papers on the topic. And it's remarkable what you can understand from that sort of thing. But you're trying to look for reviews of the in evidence um, and randomized clinical trials and rather that you know, experimental studies rather than saying, I followed six patients for a year, you know, and one of them, their red big toe got better. Well, that's almost valueless information, but people kind of know that. It's, you know, I've done a randomized trial of 4,000 people with a big red toe, and it turns out that um, cutting it off is the right thing to do, that sort of thing. Um, I, and so, so, and I try to limit where I go. I try to learn that I've got trusted sources. And if, if you look at where, where I search, I search in only three or four locations. I don't go any wider than that. So what Cochrane, PubMed? There's Cochrane, of... PubMed, Google Scholar, um, you know, those, those sorts of areas. If I see an interesting reference, I might chase that down. But I'm looking for reviews. I'm looking for combined data. I'm not looking for individual studies, even although sometimes that's all you've got. Often the evidence isn't clear. Um, so you're quite critical of the vitamin industry, for example. Um, but I think some people would say in response, well, if I take these vitamins and it's unclear whether they're helping me, if they're not doing any harm, what's the problem? What's, what's your response to that? Well, it's not necessarily true they're not doing you any harm because you're not taking the vitamins in natural quantities in the way that vitamins are supposed to be taken. Vitamins are essential elements of your diet, which are supposed to be taken in the context of food. And I've got, I write a lot about this in the book, is that food, cuisine, how you cook, cooks up all these essential elements together to create something bigger than the individual vitamin or mineral. And when you take it on a bottle out of a chemist shop, you're taking it in what's called pharmaceutical quantities. You're taking it in the quantities that you take it as if it were a drug. And what we know about vitamins in the body is from their micro, as micronutrients in tiny amounts in the body. And when you take something in large amounts, they often behave in different ways. They behave in different ways according to age, according to the dose, according to what might else be wrong with you. So vitamin B12 responds very differently in your body if you've got diabetes than if you haven't. And you probably should be taking a, a different form of vitamin B12. Um, if you need vitamin B12 supplementation. Vitamin C in large doses 
is probably a pro-oxidant. In other words, it speeds up aging rather than retards aging um, because it, you're taking it in quantities you're not supposed to. And there's a signal there with antioxidants in general that they may actually increase mortality. There's certainly no signal that in supplements that you buy across the shelf in pharmacies that they do you any good. The evidence, if anything, goes the other way. So it's not a shred of evidence that vitamin E prevents dementia or heart disease, whereas there's a lot of evidence that antioxidants that you eat in your food, cook and cuisine and create, have a lot of benefit across the board in terms of your metabolism, your risk of dementia, diabetes, heart disease, and so on. And probably a bit more fun to eat than the vitamins as well. Well, that's absolutely right. Um, you, you talk quite a bit about this idea um, of locus of control being important for health. Um, I think it's a really interesting concept. It, it, it does actually raise the question of the extent to which health is political. Um, you often read about this thing called social determinants of health. So your circumstances in society, the amount of autonomy you've got, the amount of control you've got have a big impact upon your health. I'm just wondering, just following the logic of that through, does, does, does this idea that if you have more control in your life, you're healthier, um, have implications for what we expect from governments? Huge. Um, medicine is actually a social science. And any doctor who thinks that's bunkum is not going to be a very good doctor. It always has been a social science and always will. And when politicians, usually on the right of the spectrum, say that doctors should stay in their lane and treat people and not make comment about society or how society is organized, don't understand what medicine is. Medicine is a social science. One of the reasons why the medical system costs us so much is we ignore that at our peril. Um, this is an idea that um, has been with us forever, but was particularly pioneered in the 19th century by a scientist, a hardcore biomedical scientist in the 19th century called Rudolf Virchow. Now, Rudolf Virchow invented modern pathology. He found that, and he could get nothing more microscopic than that this in, his, in those days, even now, he found that you could trace back disease to cells. You could say, oh, this disease started in this particular cell in the stomach or in the heart or in the arteries and so on. Um, so he invented, in a sense, cellular pathology. So, but he was also politically radical. And so, well, let me just say, before I go on with this radicals, radicalism, he, op he was one of the leaders of the opposition in the medical profession to the germ theory of disease. So when Pasteur found that germs cause disease, which is actually very similar to Rudolf Virchow's ideas of cells cause pathological disease, whereas you know, and what Pasteur found was that there are these bacteria that cause disease, Virchow reacted strongly against it. And it took 30 years for the medical profession to accept the germ theory of disease. So what, what was going on here? Well, he was a political radical. He had seen the food riots in Upper Silesia amongst coal miners. And he realized that the origins of disease are social in context. Now, if anybody disbelieves me, we are just coming through a pandemic that was caused by people and politics and how people live. The germ of COVID-19 is the least important part of this COVID-19 pandemic. We have created it for ourselves. Politics cause pandemics. I can come back to that if you want. And that's what Virchow found. He found that the social causes of disease were incredibly potent. And he couldn't believe that it could be so simple as a bacterium causing a disease. And he was both right and wrong. And when uh, Robert Koch found the tubercle bacillus, the bacterium that causes tuberculosis in the late 19th century in Berlin and proved that it caused tuberculosis. What Koch didn't know was that if he went out into Berlin and tested, if he, if he could have in those days, people for tubercle bacillus, most of Berlin would have been carrying it, yet only a relatively small proportion of the population had the disease tuberculosis because the reasons you got tuberculosis were very complicated and significantly social in origin, about nutrition, 
hygiene, and even whether you lived in a community where there women, young girls, were taught to read and write. Because work done by Barry Smith, the late Barry Smith at the Australian National University showed that when you looked in Europe at parishes side by side, which were just as poor and just had poor nutrition, the ones that seemed to get less TB were the ones where they taught girls to read and write. And let me tell you, the Taliban knows this. That's why they blow up schools and kill teachers that teach little girls. Because when you teach little girls to read and write, society changes and it becomes healthier. So, and that's what Koch, that's what Virchow was on about. Medicine is a social science. We have, we have a pandemic going on now that was created by the way we've organized our society. And yes, vaccines are helping, drugs are helping, that's great. But the next pandemic will be caused by human behavior. It's cost us trillions. It's cost us millions of lives that we will never even know the true numbers of people who've died of COVID-19. And they've, done, they've died because of poverty, disadvantage, and fragile authoritarian leaders who don't believe in international cooperation. So just, um, just on that, how was COVID caused by the way we organize society specifically? So bats throw off viruses all the time. Almost certainly this is a bat virus. Um, could have come from the lab, but almost certainly a bat virus. If it did come from the lab, it wasn't deliberate. It was an escape. The next one could be deliberate, by the way. Um, it lands, if it had come, if it had emerged 10 years ago, I don't believe there would have been a pandemic. 10 years ago, Xi Jinping did not have the authoritarian power and hold over China that he's got now. The memory of SARS-1 would have been fresh in the minds of the Chinese because they stuffed that up. They'd have been more likely to have admitted they've got a problem and acted on it quickly and called in help. Obama was the president of the United States. It was a time of international cooperation and the world would have got together on this. Um, and it would have controlled the pandemic. We wouldn't have had vaccines the way we've got them today, but we might not have needed the vaccines at that point because it would have been under control. This virus landed in a city, 12 million people, where the people who ran the city were frightened of Beijing and they kept it quiet. They victimized the people who wanted to bring it forward. You've got to be transparent about this. So it was hidden and spreading before they could control it. Um, it landed in a world, and, the, and people left Wuhan and went around the world. And it landed in a world that was being run by fragile men with authoritarian personalities. Donald Trump, Vladimir Putin, Orban, Bolsonaro, Duterte, and I could go on. And when it didn't land in countries like that, it landed in countries with libertarian leaders who had read Ayn Rand and believed that there was very little role for government and you should let this run. Britain is the classic example. Sweden is also an example. Let this run. We'll get what's called herd immunity. 45,000 people died in the United Kingdom in the first few months of this pandemic in a search for herd immunity and let it run because we don't want to inhibit people's behavior. And all they got for that was 6% level of immunity in the community. It was back to bad British leadership at the Battle of the Somme, send them up over the edge. We don't care, 45,000 people died. Thousands died in Sweden. And we were close to doing that too. Don't believe we weren't. We were close to doing that too. We didn't want to close down. We had to be forced to close down and embarrassed into it. Human, changing human, we, when COVID-19 landed in the world, um, it, it, you know, spread around the world, January, February, March of last year, we behaved just as we've behaved for centuries. We behaved just like the Black Death in the 14th century. We put, we put, travel, travel spread it, human behavior spread it. We closed our borders. We, we exaggerated the lines of the disadvantage and the advantage and the disadvantage came off worst. We nailed people into their apartments and stopped people spreading it in the community and, and prejudice reigned. Donald Trump called it the China virus. When syphilis 
which came from the New World on the boats of Christopher Columbus, landed in Spain. Um, so international travel, um, landed in Spain. Uh, the Spanish royalty couldn't afford another voyage. Economics. The sailors had, who were infected with syphilis had to find work, poverty. They found work as mercenaries in the siege of Naples, warfare. Warfare is a recurrent story in the cause of epidemics. And the siege of Naples is where the first known outbreak of syphilis occurred. Trump called it the China virus, the Italians called it the French pox, and the French called it the Italian disease. Nothing changes. It's interesting, this, this idea of this link between health and, and politics. I'm wondering, you talk a bit about um, Indigenous Australians and the way they describe um, the conditions that affect their health and being about really having autonomy and control. I'm wondering, does that mean that um, we could make a strong argument, for example, that a treaty would improve health outcomes for Indigenous Australians? 100%. If it was a treaty that was drawn up by Aboriginal people and, um, you know, and, 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 and accepted more, more generally. Um, you know, the Treaty of Waitangi, disadvantaged though the Maori are, they are less disadvantaged than Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, First Nations people in Australia far less disadvantaged, with far less disparity. There's a lot of dis disparity. There's a lot wrong with uh, First Nation, you know, the gap between First Nations peoples, people in um, First Nation peoples, I should say, because of the Pacific Islanders as well, pardon me, in New Zealand, um, and, uh, and, and the Pākehā, but it's even bigger in Australia. We have no treaty. We've never recognised Aboriginal people as the original owners of the land. We spout forth kind of meaningless uh, acknowledgements of country because we've got to do it and we're told to do it by our bureaucracies, but it doesn't translate into real action. Um, and so uh, that you know, we say, oh, well, why are Aboriginal people going on about you know, self-determination and control, et cetera, you know, when what their problem is high cholesterol levels and high smoking levels and so on? It's just that the first thing, you know, go and ask an elderly white person who's well off, I'm going to take you out of your home. I'm going to put you in a residential aged care facility. And they say, you're not going to do that. And so I'm going to bring somebody in to look after your house. Oh, you're not going to do that. Why do people react like that? Because they're losing control. And that happens on a mass scale in Aboriginal communities and has direct correlates with how their immune system works, with how they control their um, the, the cardiovascular system and their ability to actually have the self-determination to do something about their lifestyle. Uh, they don't even have, they don't have housing to live in. They've been given the housing that some white designer has designed that thinks is right for Aboriginal communities and it falls apart. Not because Aboriginal kids, you know, the, the prejudice is that Aboriginal kids tear houses apart. They don't tear houses apart. Within a matter of months of a new house going up, the, the kitchen isn't working, the bathroom isn't working because it's been badly built and there's nobody to maintain it. How can you actually do stuff about your cardiovascular health if you don't have a well-designed house to live in? Does this idea about the importance of control have implications for how we think about things like vaccine mandates, for example? Does it mean that we shouldn't be forcing people to do things? Um, so vaccine mandates should be the last thing that you do. You should create good reasons why people should have their immunization. And we're reaching 90-odd um, percent coverage of the Australian population without significant mandates. Yes, healthcare workers. I mean, I, I think that um, if you're a healthcare worker, an aged care worker, face-to-face um, -face in a risky environment like an aeroplane, then you should be expected to be immunised. And that's just that just goes with the job and it's part of your moral duty as part of that job. But mandates for other people um, should... Um, you, you know, and there are mandates for parents with children in a sense there are mandates is if you, you want your kids to play with others and go to pre preschool they've got to be immunized because your kid's going to be a risk to everybody else and you're creating a risk for your own child because um, we've got to have herd immunity for these childhood vaccines so it, it's kind of the end of the road but the reality is the the hard core of people who don't get immunized in Australia is probably about five percent of the population where you know it's 
being caused by 5G, you're sticking a microchip in my arm. Um, you know, these are experimental vaccines and you're changing my DNA forever. You know, the, it's Looney Tunes and just leave them to their Looney Tunes because they're such a small group of people. Most Australians are just sensible about it. They've been hesitant because they've been worried about Astra and they're waiting for Pfizer coming along. Um, and, and they recognize that the risks of COVID are hugely greater than this. And, uh, you know, I've always thought we could get to 90% because that's what we get to 90, 95%. The ACT is 98%. It's going to get, the one, you know, it's only been a couple of percent of people aged over 12 who are not immunized. I mean, that is extraordinary. And it'll be like that um, in New South Wales and Victoria and hopefully in other states as well. And if they don't get to those levels, they'll watch New South Wales and Victoria living free lives, traveling internationally, and they'll be living in fear in Fortress WA, Fortress Queensland, Fortress South Australia. Okay, so let's let's move on to the optimistic thing of getting out of um, <laughs> lockdowns and um, uh, some of the audience questions we've got. Um, a lot of people, it seems at the moment, are actually starting to think about um, uh, diet and health as, as we sort of come out of this this phase. So one of the questions I got was, um, one of the audience questions was, any jumpstart tips on how to lose the COVID kilograms? <laughs> There's a Nobel Prize in that one. Um, you you could start by, if, if you're an adult, not a child or an adolescent, because they need breakfast, you could start by skipping breakfast. If you skip breakfast, you actually, and it's a very relatively easy thing to do, you do actually reduce your calorie intake during the day. And I talk about that in the book. And that's one simple thing that you can do. You can, ex you can do a food diary where you examine, um, there are plenty of online food diaries, um, and you could actually record what you eat each day with an accurate idea of your portions. And just recording and watching what you're doing each day will tell you where you're going wrong and fairly minor adjustments will get you down there. You don't necessarily want to, crash out and go on a very low calorie diet, but you can go, come in for a slow landing over a period of months where you're coming down. Um, we've actually had quite a lot of exercise during lockdown, probably more than many people have got. Our dogs are completely knackered from uh, all the exercise that we're giving them. Um, but you know, maintaining that exercise while controlling that, if you can cut down your alcohol dramatically, <laughs> that will make a huge difference. If you've been drinking, if you've been drinking um, a lot each day, um, or even some each day, if you actually keep your alcohol to once a week and really you know, limit that, then that will make a big difference. There are probably fairly small things that you can do that make a fairly big impact over time. Another question I had was, um, what are your thoughts on the vegan diet? My thoughts have changed on the vegan diet. Uh, first of all, there's pretty good evidence that populations who are on a vegetarian diet, so that's mostly a plant, but let me just say, there are a lot of people who say they're vegans or vegetarians, but they, they're flexible, which is great. So they'll go to a restaurant, and they might eat fish once a week or once a month. Um, they might eat dairy occasionally and so on. So people move in and out of these diets, but let's assume that you're purely vegetarian. So there's, there's a fair bit of evidence that a, a largely plant-based diet, vegetarian, you, um, you do live longer you probably live about six years longer than average than people who are eating a lot of red meat. <clears throat> There's less evidence about veganism. And a few years ago, veganism was probably not that healthy a diet <clears throat> because there weren't that many choices for you. And so you tended to eat, well, I can't, I can't say what people tended to eat, but the choices were pretty unhealthy. High fat, fried foods, uh, tomato sauce. I mean, it was just boring, really hard to eat. Um, and many people who are on a vegan diet were doing it for beliefs that I, I don't want to exploit animals and um, uh, or the climate impact of meat and so on, all very legitimate reasons for eating a vegan diet. Now it's actually quite easy. The supermarket, you know, there are lines of supermarket shelves with vegan products on them. Um, and even products that you didn't realize were vegan are vegan. So you can actually eat a very wide range of food. There's, there's really quite a sophisticated vegan cuisine, there probably always was, but we're now, um, I, you know, one of my favorite restaurants in Sydney is a vegan restaurant. And I take, I take people to it and don't tell them it's a vegan restaurant. They come, what a great meal. And I say, well, you know, it's vegan. Um, and so I, you know, I think it's much easier to be vegan. And if you're eating a broad spectrum of foods and getting your vitamins, B12 is, can be a problem. Um, you just gotta be a bit careful with it, but by and large, it's a safe diet and it's likely to be very good for you.
You touched on um, sort of not eating breakfast and um, which sort of goes to that idea of intermittent fasting being quite good for you. And I think you mentioned in the book this idea of becoming comfortable with hunger, um, that the idea that you should have a little bit of hunger. I, I've got a question, which is, um, does intermittent fasting reduce cholesterol? Um, good question. I, I'm not sure that it does. What it does do is it stresses your metabolism and makes your control of blood sugar better. It reduces your weight and your visceral fat, and that reduces things like triglycerides. So probably indirectly, it does eventually be good for your blood fats. Triglycerides, which is what goes up when you have a, a lot of fat on your tummy, uh, they increase the toxicity of low density lipoprotein, the bad form of cholesterol complicated but when your triglycerides go up the size of the particles of the LDL go down and make it much more likely to cause damage to your arteries so you want to get your triglycerides down the best way to do that is to lose weight and lose visceral fat and intermittent fasting tends to be quite good for that I talk about the Greek paradox in the book which is um, where the longest second longest of people in the world are Greek Australians living in Melbourne I say Melbourne because they're best studied there and one of the things that they do, yeah, they eat a Mediterranean diet, they cook in the Mediterranean style, which is what we were talking about earlier, which is cuisine, and what you cook up in the pot. Um, when you cook onions, extra virgin olive oil, garlic, tomatoes, maybe even carrots together in a sofrito mix, that creates antioxidants that you can't buy over the shelf in the pharmacy. Coming back to that original question about antioxidants and supplements, you just can't buy it. And that's their in the pot so they cook like that and they cook slowly because when you cook quickly on a barbecue and you burn it that's a pro-oxidant that's a that creates pro-aging compounds um, but what they also do is that they have days of frugality the, in the greek orthodox church there are about 100 fast days a year so about on average one day in three i mean it's not it's not as regular as that they but it's not a michael mosley fast it's actually, they, they're on a vegan fast. They just eat plants, plant-based vegetables, plant-based foods for a day. So frugality every so often is probably a good thing to do. Okay. Another question that um, somebody's come up with is the question of trauma um, and the lasting impact of trauma on health. And I know there's been a lot of discussion in, in recent times about, for example, treatments of trauma, MDMA and psilocybin and some of those issues. But, but this question really was asking, how important is trauma in terms of people's overall health and well-being and what can we do about it? Well, I do write about this in the book and I talk about trauma-guided therapy. So trauma, word of warning, caveat emptor, beware of psychologists who try to dig up trauma that you don't think you've got. It's coming back to our very first conversation about overdiagnosis and medicalization. If you've had trauma, you know about it. If you've been sexually or physically abused as a child, you know about it, you remember about it. It's not a buried memory. It's not something for somebody to dig up. It's there. You might not want to think about it. You might get anxious when you do. You might have bad dreams about it. Um, but it's not a, it's actually the opposite of a repressed memory. It's, it's actually a memory that you've got that you don't like. Um, and there are other forms of trauma as well. And I talk about PTSD. Uh, I've had it. Uh, I've had it a couple of times in my life. So what, what this is all about. It does come back a bit to that locus of control because what trauma does to you is similar to losing that control over your life where other people are making decisions about you. You're not making them for yourself. You're feeling under stress and pressed by your job or by poverty in your life. And trauma does that too. And it creates chronic stress and it changes the way your brain works. And when you change the way your brain works, it changes the control of hormones and physical stuff like heart, your heart, your blood vessels, your blood pressure, uh, hormones that control your immune system, maybe even hormones that control cellular growth and could increase the risk of cancer. All those things are important. And so if you've, you know, it's important for um, a psychologist to know if you've had trauma because that might be a block to cognitive behavioral therapy. But Digging it up and talking about it and forcing you to talk about it can be a bad thing to do. It's a Hollywood myth that catharsis is good for you. Uh, understanding that you've got trauma, 
understanding their areas that you might want not you might not want to go is very important but to actually go back over your trauma some people call it trauma porn trauma porn because all it does is reinforces the bad memories so it's important to know your therapist to know that you've got it you know that you've got it you might not want to admit it it's not repressed to be dug out under hypnosis or anything like that and for that to change the therapy and to know where the boundaries are of therapy but it's not always good to dig it up we're gonna to have to wrap up in a minute i just want to um whip through a couple more questions that um people have come up with one of which was you actually just mentioned um porn there in terms of the idea of trauma but there's a really good section in the book on sex sexuality how we think about those things and i'm just interested in in your thoughts on pornography and its impact on your health um so i i, I think we've got a problem and we've got a problem with young kids watching pornography and it's at very high levels and it's changing, it's almost certainly changing the experience of sexual, sexual experience of girls and boys and what the expectations are from sex. On the other side of that, there's probably some moral panic about screens, screen use, uh, and this sort of thing. But kids are not meant to watch porn. Um, that's not part of growing up. Um, and so we do have a problem there. And we do have a pro so we've got a moral panic about screens, just like we had a moral panic about computers, just as like we had a moral panic about televisions. And in the 17th century or the 18th century, we had a moral panic about fountain pens. Whenever there's a new technology, we have a moral panic. It's not what's on, it's not the screen, it's actually what's on the screen and content. And so what I talk about in the book is parents being engaged about what's on screens trying to control it and trying to guide that that sort of behavior um, but it but it is hard and um, you know and probably not all pornography is is bad and whether you call it pornography or erotica and you know gentle erotica which is created by women for women is probably um, you know not that bad but male focused pornography which is wham bam thank you ma'am and thinking that certain practices, you know, that a woman is going to have an orgasm through penile penetration um, and, and quite violent penile penetration is bad. I mean, and what you do about that, I haven't got a clue. Um, but just thinking it's all bad is not necessarily the right thing to do. And just because a child watches it from time to time is not necessarily a bad thing. But some kids will get obsessed with it. And it is a problem in some communities. Speaking about sort of what's on the screens, um, Another thing that we've started to see recently is increasing evidence that social media is causing some um, psychological harm. For example, um, there's been recent revelations about Instagram and its impact on women's sense of body image. Um, do you have concerns around social media and its impact on people's mental health? Yeah. So Instagram's a huge issue among, uh, in, amongst gay men. Um, if you look at their Instagram feeds, it's men um, with... Um, body fat of two or three percent, you know, absolutely well cut. And so you, you have a, an obsession with um, getting to that body shape, which is often what women, young women have too. So Instagram creates unrealistic ideas of what, of, of what you should be striving for in terms of your body shape and can often drive quite unhealthy behaviors. Um, yeah, we, we do have an issue there and it gets amplified. So 20 years ago, it was, you know, girls' magazines or what they saw in women's magazines in terms of ideal body shape or men's magazines, or your fitness magazines, and you saw that there. But now it's in your face, on your feed, multiple times a day. So there is a problem. So if you were to um, sort of leave people with one um, piece of advice, because we're going to wrap up now, what would be the key thing that you want people to sort of take away from your whole sort of take on, on wellness and how to think about health more generally? Think about your way of being in the world. Think about whether that locus of control, that control over your life is here or somewhere else. And if it's somewhere else and you don't like that, work out how you actually get it back to here. Think about it that way. Very hard to deal with your general health and well-being unless you feel some sense of control over your destiny. That's step one. 
trust your instincts. Um, don't strive for peak health every day of the week. Trust your instincts. If you feel crap and you know there's something wrong, there, there is something wrong until somebody proves it otherwise. But don't let somebody else convince you there's something wrong when there isn't. Trust yourself. Fantastic. Dr. Norman Swan, thank you so much. That was absolutely terrific. It was um, very, very enlightening and I really appreciate all your time. So thank you very much. It's been my pleasure.